Hi everybody, my name is Sean O'Leary Garner and I am a senior biologist here at the Florida Aquarium and we are in one of my favorite spots in the aquarium called the Coral Farm. Uh, the Coral Farm is on the third floor. Uh, it's an amazing area where we grow Caribbean coral. We are permitted for all this coral to grow and we actually give it to other zoos and aquariums for them to exhibit for you and the guests that come to zoos and aquariums all around the country. Um, it's quite full right now. We actually are ready to fragment some of the coral and get ready to ship out to other zoos and aquariums. So you see a lot of Acropora cervicornis. Uh, that's one of our pillar corals here. Um, it is one of the most important animals in the Caribbean. It is a reef builder and you can see how it actually builds a reef. It continually grows. Um, if you see, I have all of our pumps off right now. So you can see the corals actually coming up out of the water a little bit. So those are the corals we're going to have to frag today. Um, we grow so fast here at the Florida Aquarium. Our corals are growing out of the water a little bit. So we will fragment them. Um, in the wild, most corals grow anywhere from a half inch to one inch a year. Here at the aquarium and the coral farm, we grow 10 to 12 inches a year. So we just grow at an exceeding rate. Um, one way we do that is different techniques of growing coral. Um, this is a hanging method. Um, so this is just fishing line right here and it's hanging in the water. So what that does is it gives the coral complete control of the flow. Uh, it has flow going all around it. Um, so it grows in a little bit different pattern, but it grows really fast. And also it prevents a lot of algaes from growing on it. See, it's just pure coral. Um, and what we do with this, when we're ready, we just snip the line and we will ship it to another zoo and aquarium for them to grow. Um, if this was the wild, because we do grow coral out in the wild, um, we will just snip this line and zip tie it to a rock structure or we will do a two-part epoxy and it grows right over that epoxy pretty well. We've got a lot of amazing corals over here. Um, one is called Eusmilia and this is <laughs> Eusmilia. It's a kind of a funny name, right? A um, little different, right? Uh, so each polyp is an individual animal. So when you look at this coral, each, we call these heads, each head is a separate animal and each head has one polyp and the tentacles that grow around it. If you look at Acropora cervicornis, you see there are tons of polyps and every polyp is a separate animal and they all live together in what we call a colony. So what does this tell you about the coral? This coral compared to Eusmilia. One thing right away that I know is that they eat something different. So this polyp head is about the size of a dime or a quarter. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it eats a much larger animal um, than the Acropora. The Acropora will eat very small plankton, tiny, tiny shrimp that are floating in the ocean. And Eusmilia will eat larger shrimp. Sometimes they'll eat larval fish. They can eat larval fish. Um, so much bigger. And then also, this one is at a different depth than this one. So Acropora will grow, it loves 30 feet deep. It, that's its main area, 30 feet of depth. And this coral will grow because it likes a lot of flow. It likes the small plankton that float to the top. And Eusmilia, since it eats more and eats larger items, it doesn't need to be as close to the sun. So it can go down to 100 feet and really thrive. So kind of the same thing, talking about food items and depth is cavernosa. So these are all cavernosas. Um, usually these are our prettiest corals in the Caribbean. They're the ones that can have blues, purples, and pinks. Um, right now it's kind of overcast here in Florida, but in the pure sunlight, we'll get real pretty greens out of this. Now the color um, has to tell you what kind of algaes are inside the coral. So cavernosa, like Eusmilia, 
grows deeper. So 100 feet of depth, 60 feet of depth is really good for this coral. Um, so it doesn't rely so much on the sunlight. It relies more on eating. And you can really tell with these polyps. So each polyp, remember each polyp head is a separate animal. They're much larger. Not as big as Eusmilia, but much larger than Acropora over here. So just by looking at a coral, you can really tell what it eats and what depth it grows in. So a lot of our boulder corals, our brain corals all here, they can go much deeper than the Acropora. And generally they like to go deeper too. Um, usually these corals, they, they are hard coral, remember that, but they have a tissue over the calcium carbonate. And that tissue um, will actually inflate and deflate throughout the day and the night. And um, usually when a coral is higher up in the water column, it has less tissue so that, that the strong current of the ocean won't tear that tissue off. And then also more tissue um, allows the coral to have bigger polyps and longer polyps to acquire larger food items. So you can just look at a coral over time and know, hey, I know you like 40, 50, 60 feet, and you eat prey items that may be one centimeter to three centimeters of size, and then look at the Acropora and know, hey, you like 10 feet to 30 feet, and you like very small food items in the millimeters. So just a little info about how to look at a coral and what they eat. <laughs> if you've looked over here, you kind of see this little guy. This is called a variegated urchin. Um, he is cruising through our coral farm, coral reef, and he's eating algae. And then over here, and I'm gonna keep my distance, is diadema. Diadema is actually one of the most important animals we have in the Caribbean. It's an urchin, uh, but we just like to say diadema because that's the species of it. Um, diadema is so important because it has a really strong mouth structure, um, and that mouth structure eats algae. Uh, eats algae that can overtake coral. So I have three of them in this exhibit and they help do my job of protecting all this coral and they eat the algae away from the coral so that the algae doesn't overtake the coral. Um, what's really unique about them is that they have a neurotoxin. So if you were to bump into one of these guys, um, they would inject a neurotoxin into your body. Now some people can um, have mild pain and it will hurt maybe for a day or so. For me, I pass out in about 10 minutes. I'm really affected by this neurotoxin and I've worked with these guys for 15 years and I really highly respect them. Um, they're amazing. So the Fuller Aquarium is growing these on our offsite facility to put back in the ocean because they're so um, amazing at eating the bad algae that grows in our Caribbean. So that's why we have them here. I have a couple other species of urchins and we have a couple other fish that help keep the, the reef here clean. Um, there's some other amazing corals. Now, one thing I do want to show you before we move on is the first sexually reproduced Acropora cervicornis in the world. Um, it's this one here. <laughs> It's on a tile. We actually have it on a tile. Um, this animal is five years old now. So, this, so why it's important, this was a sexually reproduction of Acropora. So what that means is we actually went out into the wild during a spawning event. And spawning events for this species is usually in August. And we go out and we collect the spawn. It's usually one night of the year. And we collect the spawn and we raise it. And I've done coral spawns for seven, eight years. It's really fun. It's also really difficult, especially a new species that you don't know how the, the larvae floats, how the gestation is. Um, but the Florida Aquarium with a ton of other um, help from Georgia Aquarium, the university, multiple other facilities, we were able to successfully raise one baby. That was five years ago. Now, when we do spawns, we, we get thousands. We, we are so good at it now. We know exactly when they spawn. We know exactly how to collect the spawn, and we know exactly how to raise them. When we did this, 
We had no idea, so we had to learn. And now we, we do this, we do it well, and we teach others how to do it. And then we move on to a new species on how to reproduce that sexually. Why it's important to sexually reproduce coral is uh, it creates different species that can adapt better. So I'm gonna show you how we asexually reproduce coral, but sexual reproduction is one of the most important to create diversity in this world. Um, so the corals need to sexually reproduce to find each other and to create more diverse animals that can adapt to the changes in our ocean. And once we find a really good coral, we will asexually fragment it. So right now we have all this Acropora that my job today is to asexually fragment. So we'll get into my big bag of fun here. I just feel like a medieval doctor when I open up my fragging supplies. So I have a couple bone shears. Um, why we have to use such strong shears is because this coral is made out of calcium carbonate um, and it's really strong. Now we're gonna fragment the, the tip, which is a little, not as strong. If you go down to the base, we actually have to use much larger shears for this. So it's really easy. Um, you just take it where you see a point where you can fragment it. Um, I'm gonna hold the other tip. And if you guys see I'm wearing gloves, you guys always have been taught never to touch a coral. Um, we still say that. Um, I actually wash my hands of any soaps, any lotions, and then I put gloves on so that I can safe, safely pr uh, touch this coral. So I'm gonna apply pressure. You're gonna hear a pop. Well, that wasn't too loud, but, um, and this is really neat. Um, so in the winter months, is when this coral actually makes its eggs. And I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna look for eggs. Um, I really don't see any right now, but the eggs will be on the outer edge and they'll be pink. So in the winter months is when this coral creates the eggs. And then in August, every year, the hottest month of the, the year, they will release those eggs. Um, so now I have a fragmented coral. So this is a fragment. So this is genetically similar to its parent. So we created a genetic similarity uh, fragment here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put this fragment in a little bath. I'm gonna get a frag plug. So these are your common frag plugs right here. These are designed, they're usually made out of ceramics and they go into egg crate and you can make a lot of frags out of this. Um, this coral's a little larger, so I'm gonna use a frag plug that I made. This is just a concrete mixture. Um, concrete's pretty uh, good in coral exhibits. They actually help out with calcification. And then I use super glue. Um, there's quite a few things you can use to, to attach a coral to a frag plug. Uh, super glue is one of the safest things. There's also two part epoxies you can use. Um, we will use really strong two-part epoxies in the ocean and uh, we found that it doesn't do anything harmful to the coral. So what I want to do is just do some super glue. I want to make sure this is mildly dry. Um, moisture does help the coral set so we'll put some moisture on it, some salt water on it later. So you can put your super glue on your coral plug <laughs> and as best how you cut these you want a nice flat surface and I kind of flat for a little bit um, and a true Aquarius will put this coral on and it'll set standing straight up. Um, that's the best way. The coral was already standing straight up so it will grow better if it's standing straight up but if it doesn't work out we can lay it down. So you see how it's already setting? So then I'll dip it in salt water and I'll cure that glue so it's wanting to lean over a little bit. So you sometimes got to hold it um, till it attaches completely. And this can take a couple minutes and we might not have time for this. But then what we do is we will put this in a little area and I'm gonna get a little bit of help here from another frag plug to kind of stand it up. And yes, the coral is out of the water. So if you don't know, a lot of corals are adapted to be out of the water um, here and there. In the Indo-Pacific, corals at the very top surface are adapted to be out of the water twice a day. And it's really unique 
they will create a mucus that protects them from the UV light rays. Now, Caribbean coral don't have that as much. There's not too many Caribbean corals that go out of the water, but this um, Acropora has adapted a little bit to being in coral form. And what I do, I just keep it moist right there. Um, so after a couple minutes, it'll attach. And then what we do, we'll grow this until the tissue will overgrow the, um, the cement or the, the, the glue and then we say it's ready to go. It's ready to be shipped to another zoo and aquarium so that they can display it and they haven't taken from the ocean. Um, trying to find another frag. My boss actually did one and it's pretty amazing. He, I can't even get it out. It's actually grown into the reef. It's, it's about a foot long right now. So a year and a half ago, my boss grew this one. I taught him how to fragment a coral he glued it to the plug right there, and a year and a half later, it's grown this entire thing. So it's pretty amazing. So the same thing we can do with Eusmilia. Eusmilia is a really easy coral to fragment. Um, we just cut off one of the heads. You can see how this grows. So look at this, this is pretty amazing. So this coral grew from one head, one head right there, and it grew all these other heads. That's pretty awesome. So um, we'll usually cut from here, make a nice flat surface, and make another asexual reproduction of this coral. But what we're really hoping is they sexually reproduce and we can create more diversity. Now, those are easy. The bigger ones, your bolder corals, we fragmented these a couple years ago. You can see them, they're on plugs right now. This, we use a diamond tip band saw. <laughs> so that sounds expensive, it is. And ooh, there's an emerald crab. See that guy right there? That guy is specially designed to eat something called bubble algae. His claws are actually flat and he's designed to eat bubble algae, which can overgrow and take over coral. So I keep a few of these guys and they reproduce on their own, um, keep the exhibit clean. So, but you see this coral, is actually growing over its frag plug here. It was actually on a very small one and I had to put it on a larger one last year and you can see it growing onto that. And then sooner or later, I'll either, either have the choice to cut this with a diamond tip bandsaw or put it on another plug so it can keep growing. Um, but it's pretty amazing, they're awesome. So yeah, that, so let's put the <laughs> frag back in should be ready all right so there's our frag and usually i put it in a nice mellow calm area so i'm actually going to put them next to our baby um and in literally probably three weeks he'll overgrow that glue and in probably two months he'll overgrow that concrete and he'll be ready to ship ship to other facilities and we'll ship these to other facilities um, it's really amazing to get these corals in other aquariums um, i know we're probably at two dozen aquariums right now so it's really great to go to these facilities and see their exhibits that are just wowing guests and talk about the coral and how amazing it is and you can see the sun's coming in the reef is getting a little bit brighter um, you can really see some of the corals now and everyone that lives around them. And usually you can't see in here because um, we have the flow, but yeah, it's, it's gonna be a good day. Good, good coral fragging day. But that's about all I have. Um, thank you for coming to the coral farm. Come upstairs. If you ever see me around or any of the other uh, biologists, ask them about the coral farm. Um, We've grown coral in here for years, and we have a much larger farm off-site. But uh, my name's Sean O'Leary-Garner, um, and it's happy to have you here. Thank you very much.